my name is Carol Marasig and we are here at Almost Diplomatic. I know it's been a while and welcome back. My name is Carol Malasig and we are here at Almost Diplomatic in our little corner of the internet where we talk about a lot of things about diplomacy and lifestyle. And I know that you guys enjoyed my last interview with Ambassador Testa Vega of the Philippines, who is now in Korea. And you have been asking for more interviews, more conversations with diplomats that are more candid and more light. So today we are having one of my favorite ambassadors. So please allow me to welcome Ambassador Mary Kay Carlson. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you, Ambassador. And thank you for welcoming us to your home. I'm so glad you're here. It's so beautiful, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, I've been here maybe 10 years ago. And of course, it's still the same structure, but you've put a lot of personality in it. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a beautiful home, mm. as I think you know, was mm -hmm. built in the mid 1960s. So it's mm -hmm. a mid century modern uh, by a very famous architect mm -hmm. here, Philippine architect uh, Gabriel Formoso. Yes. So mm -hmm. it has got amazing bones. This house has great of bones, course. great structure, mm -hmm. and I think, of course, everyone puts a little personality into it. But this house mm -hmm. shines no matter what's here. We've also heard about having something, you having something very special. Very special, here. absolutely. Okay. This is a one mm -hmm. of a kind. This mm -hmm. in. In all of our properties all over uh, the world that, uh, that are owned by the State Department, mm -hmm. this is absolutely unique. And it's a swimming pool mm -hmm. with an amazing tile mosaic of aquatic uh, uh, creatures mm -hmm. and plants. And it is done by none other than Vicente Manansala. Wow. I know when I say that word, every yes. Filipino is a national treasure, a national artist. Mm -hmm. And he's known for being the father of transparent cubism, I think. Mm -hmm. So he's very... Yes. And when you go to the National Museum here, amazing mm -hmm. paintings. He also did a lot in stained glass, but not as much tile work. True. And the swimming pool here is truly amazing. So this is very rare. It's actually very beautiful. I kept looking at it. And every time I find myself in your home, it's something that I really, really want to see. It's been, mm -hmm. we had it appraised. And actually, it was mm -hmm. uh, the State Department completely renovated over, mm -hmm. the, over the decades because it was started in 1965. That's when mm -hmm. he began the tile work. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it's a mosaic, absolutely intricate and beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. um, but it over the decades, of course, tiles had chipped, mm -hmm. abrasive cleaners had messed things up. They had a, a, a art restorer come, who found a tile uh, specialist in Portugal that would mm. was willing to match special uh, shapes and special colors. Wow. So we brought uh, the artisans here mm -hmm. using specially produced. Uh, tiles in Portugal mm -hmm. to refurbish it about a year and a half ago now. So it is mm -hmm. absolutely in its splendor right now yeah. uh, and, and totally just uh, an amazing thing to witness. And I love how that's also very telling about how you also take care of the relationship, you know. I, I always tell this to people that diplomacy is not just about like doing something for the sake of doing something. There's always something that's going on behind it. And I feel like you taking care of the work of our national artist in a home that the U.S. already owns. That's actually very beautiful. Well, yes, this is the U.S. ambassador's residence, mm -hmm. but it's a the architect is Filipino, mm -hmm. uh, Gabby Formoso. The, the swimming mm -hmm. pool is by a, a national artist. Mm -hmm. The three parts of the uh, residence itself Mm -hmm. are designed to reflect the geography here, that Lusan, Visayas, and Mindanao, they're three separate buildings, mm -hmm. and the water that features mm -hmm. that reflect the archipelagic nature. As you know, there's more mm -hmm. water than land in mm -hmm. the Philippines territory. Uh, so it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful reflection mm -hmm. of the Philippines and the fact that it's the U.S. ambassador's residence. Mm -hmm. We are the second owners. Mm -hmm. uh, mesh shows that meshing of our two cultures. Yeah. Maybe you can tell me about your stay here in the Philippines so far. How has uh, your tour been so far here in the Philippines? What have you enjoyed so far while staying here? Well, I feel so fortunate to be mm -hmm. in the Philippines, especially at this time. When I got here, everybody's still wearing masks, but mm -hmm. luckily the face shields were gone. Yes. Um, and mm -hmm. soon thereafter, masks were lifted for outdoors and mm -hmm. then for indoors. And, and people started getting back really full-fledged. Mm -hmm. Wherever you were during the pandemic was mm -hmm. going to be tamped down. And I would have hated to miss mm -hmm. uh, Philippine food, Philippine people, Philippine uh, friendship and culture, mm -hmm. and there's no one mm -hmm. that entertains 
uh, like the Philippines. There's no galas and mm. receptions. People are so hospitable here. Mm. So I feel very fortunate to arrive here at this time mm -hmm. on on those that people to people connection level. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also been a whirlwind because at the same time I was arriving, the new administration was starting here. We are emerging mm. from the pandemic. Uh, President Biden and, and Kamala Harris were sp specifically focused yeah. uh, on this relationship. Mm -hmm. As you know, within weeks, President uh, um, Secretary uh, Blinken mm -hmm. came here yeah. within weeks mm -hmm. of my arrival. So you get here and like, wow, the big boss is coming. <laughs> yeah. And then the bigger, bigger boss, yeah, when, yes. uh, Kamala Harris came. Mm -hmm. And then we've had the Secretary of mm -hmm. Defense and so many. So I, I kind of feel like it was like a a slingshot, all that pent up demand during the pandemic yes. mm -hmm. when there wasn't, uh, we didn't have an ambassador for a while. Yeah. And then there was the election. So people weren't focused, you know, they're between yeah. the, the elections here. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, Elections are held, pandemic's over, ambassadors here, and yeah. we're just all that yeah. pent up demand for engagement. From, from not a lot of activity. From, from not a lot of activity to, to a tremendous amount. Yeah. And that's on the mm. people to people, but also mm. it's a very consequential time in terms of looking what's what, what is happening mm -hmm. in the Indo Pacific, yeah. uh, working together to ensure that we have a region mm -hmm. and a globe that is free and open and prosperous, giving mm -hmm. uh, our, our citizenry the mm -hmm. opportunity to be partners in prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a very uh, meaningful t thing as well uh, that, that is uh, happening during my tenure. I love the, how you always use friends, partners, allies. Yes, yeah. friends, partners, allies. And now I've added a new hashtag, mm. uh, friends, partners, foodies. Oh. <laughs> Trying all, of the, good, all <laughs> yeah. the good food in the Philippines. What's your favorite food so far? Well, I love ube. I had never eaten oh. uh, ube before, so that's mm -hmm. a great uh, on the sweet side. Mm -hmm. And and I also I know it seems maybe mundane, but lumpia is just so great. Uh -huh. And uh, I like the the, the fried comfort, one. The, yes, yeah, okay. the fried, well, I also like the other kind. The other but the fried kind, I think, is the more traditional, the more, and it's also mm -hmm. the more fattening. So that of is. course, therefore, it probably means it's the best tasting. It's always tastier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I've everywhere I've gone, I've had uh, interesting things. When I went down. Uh, to Mindanao, you know, beautiful uh, fish there, mm -hmm. and um, sea urchin, which I enjoyed trying down there as well. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, well, just all over the lechon in different parts yeah. and the pancit around. Sure. Every region has their own variety. Yeah, we have different uh, ones. North and Pampanga, yeah. we had the sisig, which was mm. really great. I love sisig uh, too. I know. <laughs> There's so many things to like, yeah. and I, sadly, mm. um, the scales is telling me how much I enjoy the, the food here. But you walk a lot. I know you walk a lot. So, uh, well, mm. uh, yes, actually, mm -hmm. um, in the last, I try to. The problem is here. Um, mm. We're always scurrying from one meeting to the other, and with traffic, it's it, we're spending a lot more time in the car mm -hmm. than, than we do on foot these days. So, but you do have a big property and lots of space to walk, yes, which is exactly. great. I wanted to ask you about the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you end up becoming a diplomat? Well, mm -hmm. I went to a small liberal arts college in mm -hmm. Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and I was interested in history and mm -hmm. foreign language, and I thought, well, maybe I'll be a lawyer. But then I had an amazing professor my mm -hmm. freshman year in college who was a real mentor, mm -hmm. uh, Colonel David H. Likes, Dr. Likes. Mm -hmm. And he actually, I drew a bad lottery number my third trimester. Mm -hmm. We had four courses, four courses, two courses at okay. the, the college mm -hmm. where I went. And back in the day, you actually drew a lottery number. And mm -hmm out of a, like a piece of paper, you know, there was no mm -hmm. random to, uh, selection for how you got to choose your courses. Mm -hmm. And my number was so high, in other words, such a bad number that by the time I went to choose my classes, mm -hmm. everything I wanted to take was gone. So I ended up taking politics of Latin America mm -hmm. and lesser known plays of Shakespeare. Now, lesser known plays of Shakespeare did not change my life, but that politics of Latin America course did because mm -hmm. I met David H. Likes, mm -hmm. long since deceased, but he introduced me to the whole field of foreign affairs and mm -hmm. foreign policy. And he told me about uh, the Foreign Service and uh, introduced me to just a, a world that I never would have known mm -hmm. had I not had that bad lottery number my freshman year in college. Mm -hmm. So it's really about what you make of what life brings us, right? I, that's mm -hmm. exactly right. And mm -hmm. I tell people all the time when I meet uh, young mm -hmm. uh, folks starting out in their careers, that one of my maxims now is sometimes you don't know what you mm -hmm. should want. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I didn't know that I should want to be uh, in mm -hmm. the Foreign Service because I didn't know that it existed. Mm -hmm. And so when you end up with your second choice or your third choice or whether it's a university or a job, once you get there, sometimes you realize, wow, 
if I had, you know, known what this was like, this should have been my first choice. And the, these kinds of realizations, they only come after, right? Like exactly. right there. When because you don't, there. you know, you don't know what you don't know. True. Yeah, that's very, that's a very good thing to hear, Ambassador, especially in a life like the one that you chose, because it can also be very unpredictable. You cannot plan ahead, like where will you end up in like maybe 10 years down the road or 15 years down the road. Exactly. And this career also brought you to, like you met your husband also, mm -hmm. and you were both diplomats. Exactly. Yeah. We, yeah. I started out in 1985, mm -hmm. and I think he started in 1987. Mm -hmm. And we had different paths. I was in uh, Latin America and mm -hmm. Africa and was back in Washington. He had been in uh, in Latin America and in Moscow. He was mm -hmm. interested in the, the, well, the Soviet Union at the time. Okay. That's way, way back when. And we were both in Washington at the same time. And he was um, already planning to go out to, to Beijing. He'd already mm -hmm. lined up his assignment when I met him. And he, you know, we started dating. He said, how about China? And I thought, wow, I didn't even see Asia in my peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. I had just always thought with Spanish, Swahili, and mm -hmm. Portuguese, three languages after Kenya and mm -hmm. the Dominican Republic and Mozambique, that I would just toggle between Latin America and Africa because mm -hmm. there's so many countries and so much mm -hmm. to learn. But then I thought, well, maybe it's worth, uh, you know, mm -hmm. with this, maybe this guy's worth it. And then we uh, studied um, Mandarin mm -hmm. Chinese and went to Beijing. And we got married after, it's a two-year program for a language, mm -hmm. so we got married after the first year, and it's been great ever since. But, but again, I don't know that I ever would have ended up in mm -hmm. Asia had I not uh, met Aubrey and, and mm -hmm. gotten married. So again, sometimes you don't know what you should want. I thought I wanted Africa and Latin America, which mm -hmm. also I'm sure would have been great. Mm -hmm. uh, but my life has definitely taken different turns after mm -hmm. uh, meeting Aubrey. Yes, it's, your life feels like a lot of like saying yes to different opportunities or things that you didn't expect that you would want. Or you could also just call it bumbling along. I mean, <laughs> I think I'm not yeah. sure mm -hmm. there was ever any specific uh, uh, goal. Mm -hmm. And I admire people who say who know where they want to be in five years mm -hmm. time. I just always figured I would be somewhere great. Uh, based on small decisions that you make here and there along yeah. the way. Mm -hmm. And I, I think maybe different people approach their future differently. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I can't say I ever had like a, a five-year plan or a 10-year plan or a vision mm -hmm. of where I was going to be when I became, you know, grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure mm -hmm. happy to be here. That's a really, I'm, I'm hearing all of this at a great time, honestly. Because of course, I'm, I am that someone who actually sees way, way, way far ahead in the future, but that's not always great, right? Like you like to plan things and then things don't go your way. It stresses you out. So well, uh, that it gets back to that. Sometimes you don't know what you should want. Exactly. I mean, if you have mm -hmm. a plan like this is what I want mm -hmm. and you're singularly focused on that, then you might be missing other opportunities along the way. Mm -hmm. So if you're flexible, it's like, that. Ah, maybe that sounds good. I'll, I'll try that. That's and true. if it doesn't work out, you go to something else. But mm -hmm. uh, I... It, you know, I guess mm -hmm. everybody's different, though, and I think you have mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. kind of go with your heart on that. Yeah. But a little bit of flexibility definitely goes a long way, right? Definitely. Mm -hmm. But Ambassador, can you also tell us about the process of becoming a diplomat in your country? The process might be a bit different between the U.S. and the Philippines, but I guess it's also nice to hear how it goes for other countries. Well, the Philippines is mm -hmm. well known for having an extremely professional uh, mm -hmm. diplomatic corps. Everywhere mm -hmm. I've been, I mean, the, the embassy of the Philippines, when they're there, you know their diplomats are top notch. So I know the process mm -hmm. here is tough. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, we have a two stage process where you uh, mm -hmm. take a the written exam mm -hmm. and then there's an oral exam. And there are also a series of questions in between that the exam has changed a bit since I joined 38 years ago. <laughs> I know, 38 mm -hmm. years. There are a series of questions that you also have to answer in mm -hmm. between the written and the oral. Mm -hmm. But it's a uh, it's not about your grades. It's not about your name. It's not about where you're from or who your family is. It's mm -hmm. a, you know, it's based on just taking the, the test and passing the oral exam. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to join the Foreign Service if you are um, in, as a, in a specialist field, if mm -hmm. you're in, the, in, in uh, say, an IT specialist yeah. or an office management specialist. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to join as well. But to become a Foreign Service officer, mm -hmm. it's primarily through an exam process. Mm -hmm. And what, it's like, what, is it, what is it like being a female diplomat? Because... For the longest time, women were always the spouse, right? For maybe like five decades ago, we've read all these books of like diplomats, like doing like really crazy things and all these wonder, going on wonderful adventures and the, and they always have like a wife. So the, the roles have always been kind of set that way. But 
being a female diplomat. Well, you've actually yeah. hit the nail on the head for why it was mm-hmm. that I was in the Dominican Republic, Kenya, Mozambique, back in Washington. Mm-hmm. I used to say that I never wanted to marry. You know, mm-hmm. Why would I do that? I could see the value of a wife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they, they add value. Yeah. Husbands? Oh, I don't know. But, <laughs> until I met Aubrey, and then I realized, mm-hmm. okay, this, this makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're right. When I joined the Foreign Service back in 1985, we have something called the State Magazine. It's a magazine that talks about what's going on in the State Department. They mm-hmm. interview people. And in the back, and again, it used to be hard copy magazine. It's now online. Mm-hmm. It'll list everybody who's been named ambassador in a short blurb. Mm-hmm. And I would read this as I'm, you know, newly minted Foreign mm-hmm. Service officer, newly minted diplomat. At the end, they say John Doe, blah, 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 married to Susan Doe, and they have three children, you know. Mm-hmm. David Smith or, you know, whatever, and married to, you know, Loranda mm-hmm. or something. You, the one or two women you'd find, you get down to the bottom, often there was no married to mm-hmm. because frequently they were women who were single mm-hmm. because it's very hard to do that. The, all of the multiple roles mm-hmm. that women in our society traditionally are required to do, mm-hmm. to, to mother, to take care of the house, mm-hmm. to take care of parents, not only your parents, but his parents mm-hmm. potentially, yeah. uh, especially in some uh, cross-cultural marriages where there are even more mm-hmm. demands yeah. put on women than, mm-hmm. than even in, in the United States. Um, it's, it's challenging. So mm-hmm. there are some challenges, at least back in 1985. Mm-hmm. I think things are completely different now. That's and I think uh, I look at my daughters, ages mm-hmm. 25 and 23, and I think with, with their partners, they're going to have a completely different mm-hmm. uh, reality. Mm-hmm. They, they, don't, they don't even approach it as what's men's work, what's women's work. Sure. They really mm-hmm. don't. Uh, and and this, was, this is why when I met Aubrey, mm-hmm. it was, uh, I, I saw, he, here was somebody who's really going to be a partner. Mm-hmm. Who's going to help with all those holiday decorations <laughs> and enjoy it and yeah. be part of? Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I don't play golf. Mm-hmm. You know, at least I tried it, but I'm not very good. We don't do everything together, but we mm-hmm. have a lot of common interests. And I think the fact that he was also a diplomat, yeah. as you know, he's a retired diplomat. Mm-hmm. The fact that we are, uh, you know, had had the same career together mm-hmm. made it. Uh, we complimented each other because we knew what each other, what our what our jobs were like. What yeah. when he was working late, I knew mm-hmm. why. When I'm working late, he knows why, mm-hmm. and it works out. So there's a lot of understanding. I feel like that's also an important part because when like diplomacy for a long time, not a lot of people knew what really went on. I remember when I was back in university, when you say diplomat or embassy, most people would think passport or visa, and mm-hmm. that's about it. And Having someone who understands the kind of job that mm-hmm. you actually do is really, really helpful, especially when coming home and you want to unload like certain stresses, right? Well, yeah. the way Aubrey and I used to mm-hmm. unload when we would commute together in Washington, mm-hmm. we would get in the car and talk about the egregious mistakes in grammar that we witnessed <laughs> in, yeah. in, in cables mm-hmm. or in memos. We share a love of grammar also and oh. language. So we're always talking about, you know, but the written mm-hmm. word is so important, it you know, is. Uh, yeah. but uh, yes, it's, uh, it's good to have that common mm-hmm. understanding. But, you know, my folks, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm-hmm. I was the first person in my family. I'm the oldest of four children. Um, <clears throat> but I was the first to even travel outside the United States. Uh, when I was a junior in college, I went to Bolivia, thanks to a, 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 my professor, Colonel mm-hmm. Likes, uh, helped mm-hmm. set me up on a program uh, with some friends of his down mm-hmm. in Bolivia for the summer. Uh, but my parents, you know, would ask when I was starting out, what, what do you do? What do you, if, <laughs> now, when you are starting out in the, in the diplomatic uh, field, you do, uh, mm-hmm. in, at least in our service, consular tours. So you do mm-hmm. do visas and yeah. passports. And mm-hmm. that's a very important part of what we do because taking care, there's, there's nothing more important that we do as, uh, that we do as diplomats mm-hmm. than the, uh, taking care of American citizens overseas. Mm-hmm. That's why we're, that's why we're here is for our, yes. to, for our citizens, for those mm-hmm. taxpayers. Mm-hmm. But we're also there, our, those connections that we make mm-hmm. also benefit the, the sure. uh, U.S. citizenry. Mm-hmm. Not just that we're issuing a passport or mm-hmm. that we're giving a visa to somebody who's going to come to the United States mm-hmm. to purchase mm-hmm. uh, products that Americans are selling. Um, but it's about relationships. So I tell my mom, you know, when you're a political officer, you go out and you 
it's kind of like being a journalist. Yes. I said, mm-hmm. you go out, you meet people, you mm-hmm. learn about what's going on, and then you report that. Mm-hmm. Here's what's important in the Philippines. Here's what's going on in agriculture. Here's what's going on in cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's how we are, you know, if you're in the management field, here's yeah. here are the management challenges we're facing with mm-hmm. a, a rent issue or a flooding issue or whatever mm-hmm. it is that you have. You're reporting that back. Yeah. And then you hear what Washington tells you. Mm-hmm. Washington makes the policy. And then you explain that to the host government, yeah. here's what's important to us, mm-hmm. and will you vote with us this way at the UN, or can mm-hmm. you do this, and can we have a you know a, a visitor who wants to come yeah. to sign an agreement? It's really a, yeah. finding a, ways a lot to of, work. A lot together. of different types, yes, yeah. but it's mm-hmm. a lot like a journalist in many mm-hmm. ways in terms of the reporting element. It is true. I mean. I working as a journalist and covering diplomats, I, I hear like a lot of like these really great stories of how sometimes a simple meeting between an ambassador or a government official or sometimes like a coffee, having a one having one cup of coffee a coffee together. And then later on it leads to an agreement that benefits citizens mm-hmm. of both countries. So sometimes it just feels like it's so minor, like having a meal with someone, but it turns out that there's actually so many things that can happen in such a... Well, I think that's one thing we learned in Mm -hmm. the pandemic is how much we as human beings Mm -hmm. need to connect, True, literally physically need to touch. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember thinking the beginning of the pandemic, well, I guess we'll never shake hands again. I guess Mm -hmm. nobody will ever kiss on the cheek again. Well, that was ridiculous Mm -hmm. because that lasted all of, what, a couple of weeks and months at best (laughs) because there's an innate desire, I think, um, between people to connect, Mm -hmm. uh, physically Mm -hmm. connect, but also exchange ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's another important element, exactly what you said. What Mm -hmm. uh, diplomats do Mm -hmm. is make those connections. And it's about more than anything, it's about building trust. I mean, mm-hmm. having that trust, yeah. when you develop those relationships, mm-hmm. then if you need to have a, a, a big ask, and mm-hmm. you know, I need you to pick up yeah. my child from daycare, please, 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 you trust that person mm-hmm. uh, with your child and you know that they're going to help you out because you need something. Mm-hmm. And it's the same mm-hmm. kind of writ large yeah. on, on foreign policy issues, security issues, mm-hmm. economic issues. But what about your kids, ambassadors? You have two daughters, mm-hmm. you said, and they practically grew up with you in the foreign mm-hmm. service. So what was it like for them growing up with two parents, both diplomats? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I didn't know exactly how to be a, that kind of parent mm-hmm. because my mom still mm-hmm. lives in the same house that we moved to mm-hmm. when I was 10 years old. Mm-hmm. So we, I've lived in only three houses before I joined the, before I went away to college, mm-hmm. three houses, you know, one in, in where I was born in Fort Smith, Arkansas, one for a year in Missouri, and then the rest of the time since age 10 mm-hmm. uh, in mm-hmm. Little Rock, Arkansas. So I had wonderful parents who uh, still have a wonderful mom who mm-hmm. made a huge difference and focused on family and gave us a childhood, mm-hmm. even though they were teachers mm-hmm. in, in Arkansas. And teacher mm-hmm. salaries in the United States are not known for being high. Mm-hmm. But uh, we were a solid middle class family. And it was really all about family values. Mm-hmm. And it was about holidays. It was about going to see grandparents. Mm-hmm. But it was all about being in one place. So sure. then when I became a parent, I wanted to be like mom and dad, Mm -hmm. but I were moving around every three years and that was different. So one thing that is really important to me Mm -hmm. is bringing those family traditions and those Mm -hmm. holidays, you know, making them big where we are. Because Mm -hmm. a lot of places that you go, for example, if you're in, we we were posted in Beijing, Mm -hmm. um, Christmas, certainly back in the, in the olden days, I think it's probably more commercialized now, but yeah. you didn't, Christmas wasn't wild, widely celebrated. Mm-hmm. Halloween is a quintessentially American holiday. Mm-hmm. You don't find that in a lot of places either. Okay. So you need to bring those traditions with you and mm-hmm. establish those family traditions. And mm-hmm. it's been very important to me. And it's also helpful mm-hmm. that I enjoy, mm-hmm. <laughs> enjoy it. And how did they like being, you know, kids of diplomats that move every few years? Is it something that they enjoy? Or was it also difficult? I think it's a little of both. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I tell a story. Our youngest daughter is now 23 mm-hmm. and the oldest is 25. And we were back in Texas where my husband's from and his sister lives. They had uh, two mm-hmm. cousins there. And I guess uh, Karen must have been about 12 or 12 years old, something like that. Mm-hmm. And she was talking to her cousins that day, you know, playing there. And that evening she said, you know, 
I feel so sorry for them. They've lived in the same place their whole lives. And I thought, either we've really messed these children up or we've done something really great and only time will tell. Yeah. But she saw living in the same place mm -hmm. as yeah. An, an, an unfortunate thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of people would say, gosh, you move around every three years. That's mm -hmm. terrible. You know? And, yeah. And so. a lot of kids are also like having a hard time adjusting in different mm -hmm. environments every few years, but they seem to be doing well. well I think yeah. it's, ha it's helpful mm -hmm. that they each get along. In other words, yeah. they had their own best friend every place we moved because they mm -hmm. were close in age. Okay. Uh, but I, I heard one person in the military when mm -hmm. I was in Hong Kong, that's mm -hmm. when Karen, it's where Karen, the youngest was born uh, mm -hmm. in, in 2000. It, when we were preparing to move to Ukraine from mm -hmm. Hong Kong, I was trying, the girls were getting old enough that you really have to prep when they're mm -hmm. little. I mean, you can take them anywhere. They don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the oldest one, mm -hmm. trying to prep, and she said, this, this adult woman said, well, I, we moved around a lot in the military. And one thing my mom used to tell me all the time is, mm -hmm. let's think about your new best friend. Mm -hmm. said, what do you think your new best friend is going to be like? So you just... Pre prepare them mm -hmm. for what's ahead and uh, them up. And, yeah. and also the, it's your own attitude mm -hmm. if the parents are like oh this is terrible oh we have to go oh mm -hmm. I don't want to move oh I, you know then yeah. that's gonna the, the children are gonna sense that as well mm -hmm. and luckily Aubrey and I were always you know very excited mm -hmm. about we're living overseas and, and meeting new people mm -hmm. and establishing those relationships mm -hmm. of trust and confidence uh, that, that make the job rewarding, but also mm -hmm. make your personal life and your family life very rewarding. Yeah, yeah and I see that with you. And I, I see you at all these National Day events and how you are able to make all these great connections like so quickly with other people. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very important trait of a diplomat. Well, thank yeah. you. That's a nice compliment. Yeah, but what other traits or what other maybe skills do you think are very important for someone who wants to be in this I, career? I already hinted a little bit earlier yeah. in this conversation. <laughs> I mean, writing is so important. Yes. It, it, and mm -hmm. I think to write well, you have to read a lot, especially when you're younger. And I think mm -hmm. if you're a parent and with a newborn, reading to your children from from it, when they're in the womb even. Yeah. And I worry now with videos and everything else mm -hmm. that books are not as uh, central uh, to yeah. early childhood education as I think they should be and mm -hmm. as they were in my life. Yeah. Uh, my mom, she would read all the time mm -hmm. to us and, and then read with us and we made going to the library a big deal. Mm -hmm. But writing well is an important skill, certainly for diplomats, but honestly in mm -hmm. everything. True. If you can write well and express yourself well mm -hmm. and communicate well, well, mm -hmm. uh, whether through uh, speaking or writing, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's absolutely essential. Who is Ambassador Mary Kay Carlson outside of being a diplomat? You know, um, I was just thinking, I, I have now been a diplomat a, almost a decade longer you know, mm -hmm. at the halfway point. So mm -hmm. 38 years, I've actually been a diplomat longer than I've not been a diplomat by mm -hmm. quite a few years. Mm -hmm. But I don't really think of myself first and foremost as a diplomat. I just mm -hmm. think of myself as a person, you know, as mm -hmm. as someone who enjoys getting to know different places, different people. I think of myself as a mom. I mm -hmm. remember when I was introduced uh when I went to a training course, we had to introduce each other. I, after five minutes, we met. Yeah. And the guy that introduced me didn't say that I was a mom of two children. I'm like, well, that's really important. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, being a diplomat is is a career. Mm -hmm. But I when, when I retire, and my husband is already retired, mm -hmm. it's not, I won't define myself as by the job that I did. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm still having so much fun. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just a person. I'm, mm -hmm. I am a daughter and a mom and mm -hmm. a friend mm -hmm. and uh, also a person who's just thrilled to be in the Philippines. That's so good to hear. It's, it's a kind of career that really, it's like it encompasses almost every aspect of mm -hmm. your life. It moves your whole family. But at the end of the day, you're you. Well, yeah. You're right. Every mm. day is different. Like, mm. which type of diplomat are you going to be today? Is it, you know, Barbie ambassador? Is mm. it G.I. Joe? Is it Chatty <laughs> Cathy? Yeah. What are the receptions? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about uh, sort of pulling yourself away and thinking mm -hmm. of, of different roles that you play, yeah. there's, it's a, uh, it's very, it's different every day, which is why the job is so great. Yeah. It's, it's mm. everything. And which is why flexibility remains a very, very good skill to have too. Yes, exactly. That's very good to hear. So thank you so much once again, Ambassador, for allowing us to get to know you better and for having us in your beautiful home. 
Thank you. It has really been a pleasure. Great to see you again, Carol. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I hope that was enjoyable. I'm sure it was. And I hope that you learned so much today, as much as I did. It, I love these kinds of interviews. They sometimes feel like therapy for me while <laughs> learning so much. So thank you so much once again, Ambassador. Thank you, everybody. And I hope to see you guys again soon. Bye.